All right, so we are going to do a little uh, kind of lesson going over a lab that I would typically do in the classroom environment. So I just want to kind of go over the, the math behind this, uh, this plane. So what I've got drawn here is my awesome artistic ability shows these two balloons that are being suspended by strings. The strings are like, you know, very low mass. So in the classroom environment, we would actually use fishing string. Uh, and so the, the idea is what you would do is you would you would take these uh, balloons and you would uh, charge them up by rubbing them on your head or on your sweater, or we could take a, a fur pelt and rub them and we would build up charge on them. So in fact, let me grab a, a little diagram to express that. All right, so here I have uh, a balloon that has some neutral charge on it. So you see all the positive protons, you can see all the negative electrons, and it is currently neutral. Now, if you were to come over and you, you know, you do your best Bart Simpson impression. Hey, dude. Oh, my gosh, that's pretty terrible. That's, look at that, Bart Simpson. And so he's got his spiky hair, and he, like, rubs the, the balloon on his, on his hair. And what's going to happen? Well, uh, you are going to have any electrons that come from <laughs> my pseudo really poorly messed up Bart Simpson here. Uh, and they're going to transfer onto the electron uh, and onto the balloon. So the electrons will go to the balloon. So Bart here will become positively charged and the balloon will become negatively charged. He lost electrons, it gained electrons. And that's the direction in which the electrons will go. Uh, the latex and rubber, uh, these materials often will want to collect electrons. And... Um, and so that's the direction of travel for those electrons. Um, however, in fact, if I back up just a little bit, oops, too far. Okay, so when those electrons collect, if you take the balloon and you rub it so that way it's, it's only one side of the balloon is being rubbed up against your head, those electrons are gonna build up on this surface here. So this surface is gonna be negative and the other side relative to it will actually wind up be positive, comparatively speaking, right? So let's say that we rubbed a balloon on our head and then we did this to two different balloons, okay? Oops. And so we take the two balloons and we put them together. You notice what would happen is these two sides, these balloons are both positive, so they repel. Okay, that's great. That's actually what we want in this experiment because we're gonna take these two balloons we're going to charge them, we're going to hang them and put them next to each other, and the two balloons will repel each other because they both should have the same charge, right? They're both negatively charged. However, if these two balloons have the same charge, right? These, the size of these two balloons are positive, they, they repel, but what's easier to do, repel or rotate, right? Don't you see that the balloon would actually rotate at some point and then they stick together? And this happens in the classroom environment every time, unless you're diligent about rotating the balloon, rubbing it, rotate the balloon, rub it, right? And you're trying to get an even charge around the entire surface of the balloon. And so that's a little something to watch out for. And please understand that's why it's happening, because it's, you want a, uh, an even charge throughout the entire balloon. Otherwise, it will rotate in this way, right? It's, gonna, it's going to repel, and then it's going to rotate, and now it's going to attract. Okay, so that's, we want to watch out for that happening. All right, let's get rid of that there. Try that again, there we go. And so we, what we want to do is we want to determine uh, uh, two things really. We want to determine the value of Q, meaning how much charge is on these balloons. And then we also want to determine the value of E, or at least the number of E, meaning the number of electrons. So how many electrons are on each balloon, specifically how many electrons are on the balloon causing the repulsion. So you're not actually counting the number of electrons total, you're rather counting the number of ele um, additional electrons that the balloon has taken on. So we're gonna rub the two balloons on our heads or on a fur pelt. The fur pelt works out better because you can more easily rub the fur pelt around the entire balloon. And then you hang them. Typically in the classroom environment, we would make this length of this string one meter. And often what happens is the distance between the two balloons, this value of R, would be somewhere around, oh, maybe 
equals about 0 0.7 meters or so. It's, it's usually more than half a meter, less than, less than one full meter, um, which if you can picture it, right, one meter being 3.28 feet. Um, that means that the distance between these two balloons is a close to three feet. That's pretty significant. That's a large amount of force, actually, that's repelling these two apart. So what we want to do is we want to determine the amount of charge, okay? So in the lab that I actually uh, give to students, the lab asks for you to figure out the forces that are along this plane that is perpendicular to the string. And, uh, and if you were to release that force, the, the balloon would accelerate in that direction. However, I actually think that is not the intuitive way to go about it. It is not the simple way, at least for me. So instead, I'm going to break things down into their vertical and horizontal uh, components. So with that, I would like to ask a question. If I were to, uh, and in fact, if I were to, uh, to bring that balloon, you know what? I'm just going to draw a dot. I'm literally going to draw a dot. I'm going to say, if this was an AP question, it would just have a dot. And the question says, uh, given that this dot represents the balloon on the right, okay, if this dot here represents the balloon on the right, draw the, th the three forces acting on that balloon. Okay, so if this was an AP question, this would be question number one. This is totally typical. On this dot, draw the forces that are acting on the balloon on the right. So I want you to think about what those forces are and please uh, consider that for a moment. So I'm going to give you a moment. Okay, so in this case we would have three forces acting on this uh, uh, on this balloon on the right. And so let's go ahead and draw them out. So I'm going to draw them, I'm going to use my arrow tool even, and I'm going to try to color coordinate to some degree. So we, let's use blue for my first force, which I'm going to say is the force of gravity. So the force of gravity is acting down. I want to, there we go, change it so it's acting directly down. And, you know, let me move it over here so I have a little more room. That's a little better. And, um, and I'm going to label it, right? So I'm going to label that as the force of gravity. And typically, we just label it as mg, don't we? Right? So I'm just going to label it as mg. That is the force of gravity, otherwise known as mg. What other forces are acting? Well, let me get out my arrow tool here and uh, let's use, oh, let's use, let's use red, let's use a dark red. So I'm going to draw, hmm, how about this way? Isn't there a force acting that way? That would be the electrostatic force, okay? So I'm gonna label that with an F and a subscript E for the electrostatic force because these two two balloons are pushing off of one another, right? And so there's a force of this balloon acting this way, and then there's a force acting on this balloon due to the other one acting the other way, okay? Of course, those two arrows should be the same length, but I'm running out of room, so I couldn't do that, just so you know. Okay, so there's a force acting to the right on this balloon from the balloon on the left, and, uh, and so that's one of the forces. And then let's use yellow for the other force. There is a force that is acting up. Oops, I actually meant to have like an arrow tool so that way it's nice and clean. So let's do the arrow tool with yellow. And that is acting up and to the left, something like that. Okay, something like that. And, um, and so think about it, right? There's a force from the string acting up and to the left in that direction. So those are the three forces. And those are the only three arrows you would draw on that question on the AP test because it does not want you to break it down into the X and Y components. That's all you would write. Now, separately from that, separately from that, um, you would probably have to redraw this just for your own purposes so that way you can, you can actually break this down, right? So this would be not part of that question. Let me keep this in yellow. So we're going to break this one down into its x and y components, sort of. So typically speaking, and by the way, you should recognize that this here, I'm measuring this is the angle theta, this, uh, you know, from a vertical plumb line, plumb meaning straight up and down, 
the angle of the string from a vertical line, that is going to be my angle theta. So there's this triangle here that I'm looking at, okay? You should recognize that this angle here is the same angle theta, right? Those are the same angle. So uh, relative to this angle, this is the opposite side. Uh, if this is the force of tension, and I did forget to label it, didn't I, right? That's the force of tension. So this here would be the, the force of tension in the x direction. And then this one over here would be the force of tension in the y direction, right? This side here would be the force of tension in the y direction. And typically, we would express this in terms of the hypotenuse, meaning um, the, the, this one is the adjacent side, so it's the cosine of theta times the force of tension. This one here is the opposite side of the triangle, so it is um, the sine of theta times the force of tension. All right, so... Um, <laughs> so we normally would break this down into those components, but we're not actually going to do it uh, quite in that way because, uh, you see, the way I've drawn my arrows, they're not actually proportional in the way that they should be. Here's what I mean. You should recognize that if these are the only three forces acting on this thing, the balloons, when they push out, they just, like, hang there, right? They don't accelerate outwards, right? We, we wait until they kind of balance out, and there's these forces acting on them. So... If we have the force of gravity acting down, and it's the only force acting down, then there must be a force acting up. Well, what is that force acting up? It is the vertical component of the force of tension. So these two forces have to be equal in length, don't they? Think about that. Okay. So I'm going to redraw that so that way it's the proper length. This one is counteracting this one, isn't it? Right, Because the electrostatic force is acting off and to the right. So... I'm going to make this one the same length as that electrostatic force. Okay, you guys with me here? So I've got to, I've got to kind of move these things around so that way they are the proper length. Ha, ah, there we go. That's a little bit better. Um, I guess that one has to be at that angle, though, doesn't it? Uh, let me redraw these because I, I have the electrostatic one way too big, so I just know that... Let me, re let me do this. It'll all be better if I... If I make this one shorter, this one should be shorter, for sure. Because I know that this angle, that angle theta, has to be the same as this angle. So I have to rearrange them and fix them so that way they're the, the proper size. And this is a little bit better. Here we go. I feel better about this. I'll have to make this one just a little bit shorter to make myself feel better. So this should be the same size as that. Good. And this one should be the same size as that. Awesome. And this angle, theta, should be the same angle as that theta. And that looks like it's about right. So, since this is the same as the electrostatic force, just opposite in direction, then I am going to express that. I'm going to say that the force of tension in the x direction is equal to the electrostatic force. I'm going to say that the force of tension in the y direction, let me move this over just a little bit, the force of tension in the y direction is equal to mg. Okay? You with me on that? I sure hope so. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to also add in one other thing. What do we know? Okay, what do we know about the electrostatic force? What do we know about that? Well, it's an electrostatic force. Don't we have an equation for that? That would be that this is equal to k times q1 times q2 over r squared. Okay, so the electrostatic force is equal to k times q1 times q2 over r squared. Oops, erroneous, erroneous mark, and uh, don't want to do that. Now, wait a minute. Hold on. If this is q1 over here, let's label this as q1, and this one here is uh, q2, You've charged them both, and they're pushing, pushing off of each other. One pushes one as much as the other pushes the other. They're effectively the same charge, the same amount of charge, I, sh I should say. So rather than labeling them as Q1 and Q2, they have the same charge. I just want to find the charge of at least one of the two balloons that have effectively equivalent charges. So rather than expressing them as Q1 and Q2, 
I'm going to re-express this as that the electrostatic force is equal to k times not q1 and q2, but q squared over r squared, right? Why express them as q1 and q2 times each other, but rather just q times q, which is q squared. So this is equal to q squared, which means that this, which means that this is also equal to k times q1, uh, q2 over r squared, or the, the q squared as I expressed. So let's see here. Let's what can we express? Well, I know that um, we have our Sokotoa, right? I'm off the screen a little bit. Let me fix that. There we go. Don't forget about Sokotoa. So we usually use sine and cosine. That's what we've typically used up to this point. And every once in a while we use tangent. And so I'm going to use tangent in this case. So the the tangent of the angle theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent, right? So this angle here, the tangent of that angle is equal to the opposite, right? The electrostatic force, which we just said is equal to this, divided by the adjacent side, which is this. So let's go ahead and write that out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna transfer that down to over here, right? So I'm gonna say that the tangent of the angle theta is equal to the opposite, which is the electrostatic force. I'm going to go ahead and put in this equation. That is k times q squared over r squared. I'm going to put parentheses around all that. And that is times, uh, excuse me, that is all over the adjacent side, which is mg. To make this a little bit cleaner, I'm going to multiply each side by mg. So that means that the tangent of angle theta times mg is equal to k times q squared over r squared, right? That cleans things up a little bit. And, uh, and I remember my objective here is to solve for q. What is the charge? So now it's just simply a matter of rearranging the, the variables to solve for q. So I'm going to multiply each side by r squared, divide by k, and then Lastly, I'm going to take the square root to get rid of this square here. So I'm going to multiply by r squared, right? So tangent, I'm at the bottom of my screen, but I can squeeze this in. So the tangent of angle theta uh, times mg times r squared. And I think that, oops, didn't mean to undo that. I just want to move things up a little bit. Let me... Let me give myself a little bit more space. Ah, that's better. Okay, so that's times r squared. Uh, I have to divide by k. Just barely on my screen, just barely. Uh, that equals q squared. So I'm going to take the square root of each side, and that equals q. And just in case you're having a hard time seeing it on the screen, I'm going to move that over here. Okay. Now, uh, remember also that that could be my final equation. That's totally fine. Uh, also, remember that uh, k is equal to um, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Um, so that's just done most, mostly for mathematical purposes. Uh, epsilon naught being the primitivity of free space, it has a lot of uh, relationship to the amount of electrical resistance there is within a vacuum. But uh, in these purposes, couldn't I substitute that in for k? And that would get rid of this division inside of the radical, which is kind of just a, you know, ugly sort of thing to see. So that would turn this into the square root of tangent theta times mg r squared 4 pi epsilon naught. So that would just get rid of the k. That would get rid of the, uh, uh, the division inside of the radical. But it's not really necessary to do one over the other. To be honest, if I were doing the calculation, I wouldn't bother with that. I would just leave it as this. Uh, K, remember, is 9 times 10 to the 9th. And, uh, and so just be careful when you plug in any sort of numbers in this way to, to uh, use parentheses as needed to make sure you have your order of operations with that radical proper. Okay, so that is how we, we would develop the value of Q. Now, how do we determine how many electrons there are on the balloons? So we know how much 
charge there is uh, on the balloons, now we would want to determine uh, how much, uh, how many electrons, how many, how many extra electrons there are. Well, the charge, the elemental charge, is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. And so if I have a charge here that is, um, you know, let's just, let's just kind of make up a number, okay? Just, I don't really want to run the numbers, to be honest, but let's make up a number for a moment. Um, let's think about what the charge would be like. Uh, would it be a large number? Would it be a small number? Something like that. I want you to, I want you to consider that for a moment if you can. Uh, specifically, would it be bigger than one or less than one? What are we looking at for a number? Okay, so this would be a fairly small number uh, just for the purposes of uh, this, you know, pretend sort of thing. Let's just say that the number is uh, 0 0.5 right? 0 0.5 coulombs would be the number. And so if I have a number of coulombs, and I want to convert that, convert that to a number of electrons, and that's effectively the way I'm looking at it. So I have a, I'm going to treat it like a conversion. And if, if, if this, this is effectively one electron is equal to this much charge. So electron is like a unit, and I'm going to treat it that way. So I'm going to treat this just like any other conversion, so coulomb, coulombs are up top. I want coulombs on the bottom. This would be the 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th. Sorry, I'm running out of room to write it. But uh, so I have coulombs up top. And I think that I can make it so that you guys are able to see that a little better. There we go. And, uh, and so if coulombs are on the bottom, right, they're on top here, I want them on the bottom. So then I should have one electron here. So effectively, I'm just taking this number and dividing it by the 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. So let's see what kind of number that gets us. So that's going to be uh, this here. I've actually just already done the calculation. So we have a number of 0.5 divided by that 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th. And we get a number of 3 times 10 to the 18th. Holy cow, that's a big number. Does that not seem reasonable? Yeah, electrons are small, man, <laughs> right? And the amount of charge that each one has is a very small value. So it takes a lot of electrons to get any significant amount of charge, which seems reasonable. So let's recap this a little bit. Let me do a quick recap before we finish. So the idea here is that we take these two balloons, we charge them up, and we hang them, and they separate away from each other. We want to figure out how much charge is on each balloon. So looking at the balloon on the right and treating it like as if it's a small, tiny little object, we now have shown the forces that are acting on that balloon on the right. There are three forces acting on it. Mg acting down, the force of tension acting up and to the left, and we have the electrostatic force acting directly to the right. We should recognize that the, uh, the x and y components of this force of tension equal the electrostatic forces and the force of gravity, respectively. Okay, so we set them equal to those. So the x direction force of tension is the same as the electrostatic force. That's k times q1, q2 over r squared, which is this. And since both uh, balloons have the same charge, we can just treat it like it is, uh, instead of q1 and q2, it's q squared. The y direction is mg. So, um, so we break those down. We look at the tangent, right? So the tangent of this angle theta is equal to the electrostatic force, right? Because it's the opposite side of this triangle, divided by mg. We simply write that out, rearrange the, the variables to solve for q. Once we have q, we can figure out how many electrons there are. So that is the approach. Remember, for an AP test question, you're going to draw the forces acting on the object, not the components. That's the biggest mistake. You typically would get three points, one point for each of the three arrows correctly drawn. If you also draw the components accidentally, you're going to lose two points. You would typically uh, lose one point for every erroneous arrow drawn. So don't do that, okay? Be careful to make sure that you answer that correctly. That is a really terrible way to lose points on the AP test. So with that, I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to kind of end things here. And, uh, and so let me know if you guys have questions. All right, so that's the end. Of... That's weird that it did that. Oh, I'm still recording. I hit the wrong button.